Water 7. After being attacked by Aokiji, the crew was fully recovered and had returned to sailing. Along their way, the crew saw a giant frog doing the crawl stroke and wanting to eat it. Luffy ordered everyone to make the ship follow after it. They ended up on some tracks underwater and were nearly run over by a train traveling on top of the water, and the frog was sent flying by it. They were amazed by this sight. On a nearby station, they met with the station master named Kokoro and her granddaughter Chimney, along with her pet rabbit, who acts like a cat going beneath. After revealing that the frog Yokozuna was perfectly fine and that it was always testing its strength against the train, Kokoro explained that the train was a sea train that connects several of the nearby islands and is called the Puffing Tom. She then told them that the log pose would lead them to Water 7, a city of shipwrights where they could fix their ship and told them to get help from a man named Iceberg. The crew arrived at the city, which resembled a fountain, and sailed through the canals in the city looking for a place to dock, but the people were kind enough to tell them where to hide their boat. After stopping, a group of Luffy, Nami, and Usopp headed out to exchange their gold from Skypea and find a shipwright using creatures called Yagaras to navigate the canals. Robin counters CP9. Later, Robin and Chopper left to look around and Sanji went by himself to do the same, leaving Zoro on the ship. While Chopper was in a bookstore, a masked man walked past Robin and simply said, CP Neen, which left her in shock. When Chopper came out, Robin was gone. Meanwhile, several bounty hunters came on to the Going Merry to claim the bounty on the crew, but they underestimated Zoro's power and were quickly defeated. Luffy's group managed to exchange the gold for 300 million, and they went to dock one of the Galley Law Company. There they met Kaku, one of the foremen, who revealed that Iceberg was the mayor of Water 7 and the president of Galley La. Kaku did not know where Iceberg was, so he decided to inspect their ship in the meantime, using immense speed and leaping capabilities to rocket across the city. Just after Kaku left, Iceberg and his secretary, Khalifa, introduced themselves to the three and he agreed to work on their ship. However, as they were about to enter the dock, the crew found that all of their money was gone and they saw it being taken by several people. Luckily, at that moment, another foreman, Polly, was running from tax collectors and knocked the robbers off of their Yagara bulls, but was about to use the money to pay his debt before another foreman, Rob Lucci, stopped him. Iceberg revealed that the thieves were known as the Frankie family, a gang of dismantlers that bounty hunt and steal on the side, and were led by a powerful man named Frankie. Meanwhile, Sanji saw Robin with the masked man from before, but when they turned the corner, he found that they were gone. He later met up with Chopper, and they started looking for Robin. Meanwhile, in Dock 1, while Usopp was separated from the group, he was attacked by the Frankie family and the 200 million he had was taken. Kaku returned from his inspection of the ship and revealed a startling fact. The going merry was impossible to fix. Since the keel was broken, trying to fix it would be no different from making a new ship entirely. Though Luffy complained about this, Iceberg told him to think about it for a while. The empty suitcases containing the money Usopp carried were found, and they concluded the Frankie family was the cause. So Luffy rushed off aimlessly into the city while Nami headed back to the ship after finding out about the location of their headquarters from the galley lay workers. On the way, however, Nami found Usopp bloody and battered on the street, and he deeply regretted letting them take the money. She left him there for now so she could get everyone else and explain the situation to the others, including Sanji and Chopper who had returned to the ship. At the Frankie house, the dismantler's headquarters, the stolen money was presented to Frankie himself, who revealed that the amount would be enough to buy what they had always wanted and left his gang a bunch of money to party with. As he was about to leave, the door exploded as Usopp walked in demanding that he give the money back. After a failed attempt to attack Frankie, the others ganged up on Usopp the other straw hats went to where Naomi left Usopp, but all they could find was bloody footsteps as Luffy fell from the sky. After he explained that he was trying to leap across the city like Kaku, he was told the situation. Outside of the Frankie house, Luffy, Zoro, Sanji, and Chopper found Usopp even worse off than before. The four battled the Frankie family, destroying the building, but they found that Frankie had already left with most of the money. At this point, Luffy decided to abandon the going merry and buy a new ship. At the going merry, Usopp's wounds are treated, and the news is broken to him that they will change ships. At first, Usopp thinks they are joking, but when it's confirmed to be true, he asks if it is because he lost the money. But Luffy insists that the money would not have made any difference, 
and the ship can no longer sail. Usopp gets angry and insists that the going Mary is just as much of a crewmate as everyone else, yelling that Luffy would trust strangers he met just that day and abandon a friend that was with them from the beginning. Sivian insists that he thought long and hard to make the decision, and that if Usopp does not like the way he captains, then he should just leave. Sanji manages to get Luffy to calm down and the captain apologizes for what he said, but Usopp says those were his true feelings and states that if, if they are going to abandon Mary, they'll have to leave him behind too. As Usopp leaves the ship, with everyone else looking untearfully, he turns around and challenges Luffy to a duel over control of the ship at Tensiro that night. Based on the ship, Nami tries to convince Luffy to resolve the matter with words. But Luffy points out that Usopp is not the type to arbitrarily put his life on the line for things he did not strongly believe in. Once he issued the challenge, there was no turning back. Meanwhile, Sanji yells at Zoro for letting the Frankie family escape after they attacked him, because if they did not steal the money from Usopp, none of this would have happened, but Nami gets them to calm down. True to his word, at 10 o'clock that night, Usopp came back to the ship for his duel. The fight begins and Usopp mostly uses his weaker attacks like the Shinsen, Tamago, Boshe, and Usopp spell, but then it turns out these were simply to set up for several brand new attacks. Usopp reveals that his strategy is to not even give Luffy a chance to attack and manages to get in several damaging hits in. After being hit by a humongous explosion caused by shooting a Kayan Bashi into a cloud of explosive gas stored in a breath dial, Luffy charges towards Usopp while doing his Gomu Gomu no Bazooka attack, but Usopp absorbs the blow into his impact dial. Then hits Luffy with the full force of his own attack, thinking he won. But Luffy manages to land on his feet and brings Usopp down with a Gomu Gomu no bullet. Despite being the winner, Luffy lets Usopp have the going merry and has the rest of the crew leave the ship. The next morning, the entire city is in a frenzy with news that Iceberg was shot. Upon hearing this at the hotel they are staying in, Luffy and Naomi decided to see the mayor while the others keep looking for Robin. At the ruins of Frankie House, Frankie returns and concludes that the straw hats were behind this. As it turns out, the other Frankie family members were hoping their boss would want to avenge them and were keeping tabs on the pirates. They tell Frankie that Luffy is heading for Dock 1. Meanwhile, Iceberg manages to wake up and identify his attackers. One was a large man wearing a mask, while the other was Nico Robin of the Straw Hat Pirates. At the same time, it is announced around the town that Aqua Laguna, an annual high tide that engulfs the lower part of the city, is coming. So Kokoro, Chimney, and her rabbit come to Water 7. At Dock 1, Frankie attacks Luffy with a flame attack, leading the two pirates to believe he's a devil fruit user until he jumps straight into the canal and attacks from there. After trading several more attacks, Frankie reveals that he's a cyborg, a human with robotic parts, before the fight can go on for much longer. However, the galley lay foremen intervene. At first, Luffy and Nami think they are helping fend off Frankie, but then they start attacking Luffy. They reveal that the Straw Hat pirates are behind the assassination attempt and are trying to arrest Luffy. After much fighting with Luffy not fighting back, Frankie gets tired of everyone ignoring him and unleashes his ultimate attack, Coupe de Event, to destroy the entire dock. This Luffy and Nami take this chance to escape and Luffy decides to see if Iceberg was telling the truth about Robin being his attacker. Meanwhile, the Galilei workers search through the town for the other crewmates, and the Iceberg statement is printed in all of the newspapers at the company's headquarters, and where Iceberg lives, Luffy breaks in and rushes around the building looking for the mayor's room, avoiding the attacks of the shipwrights there. Iceberg hears about this and his Kalifa lead Luffy to his room. When the two meet, Iceberg confirms that he really saw Nico Robin, and then pulls out a gun, requesting that Luffy let him see her. Luffy says that he has no idea where she is and Iceberg shoots, attracting the attention of the other workers so Luffy manages to escape before they get there. Meanwhile, Chopper and Sanji find Robin. Robin explains that there is a darkness in her heart that will engulf the rest of the crew if she stays any longer and declares that she is leaving. Sanji tells Chopper to go back and tell everyone what happened, but he has something else he needs to do. Luffy says, Zoro, Nami and Chopper gather together and reach the conclusion that Robin may be being forced to do everything by the man in the mask. But Zoro points out that it would not be good to have false hope. Either way, they conclude that there will be another attack that night and they should confront her there. Meanwhile, Frankie decides to bring Luffy out of hiding by kidnapping Usopp and stealing the ship. In the Galilei headquarters, 
Iceberg calls Polly into his room to tell him something, and afterwards, Polly leaves his guard post to go into another room, opening a hidden safe. The four remaining straw hats gather outside of headquarters, hiding in a tree, observing the building for any events out of the ordinary when there is a huge explosion. At that point, several masked men in costumes, including Robin, rush into the building, who the workers assume are straw hat pirates. Naomi, Chopper, and Zorro decide to break in too, only to find that Luffy is gone. While the female assassin distracts the guard, showing incredible speed and the ability to jump while airborne, the man with Robin, wearing a bear mask, manages to enter Iceberg's room from the side using his Daiyodaya no Mai. He shoots Iceberg to weaken him, stating that they cannot kill him until they get the signal, and leaves him to Robin while he handles the guards. The bear mask man easily takes care of the four men tilestone, demonstrating an ability to make his body as hard as metal. At this point, Iceberg reveals the identities of the attackers. They are the government agency cipher Pole 9, who intentionally failed in the first assassination attempt in order to place the blame on the Straw Hats, and they are after the blueprints for the ancient weapon pollutant, Shrika's Pansting, which Iceberg owns through inheritance from the great shipwright Tom. Meanwhile, Zoro, Nami, and Chopper break into the building, thinking that Luffy would have distracted all of the guards by aimlessly rushing in, only to find themselves surrounded. As it turns out, Luffy got stuck between two buildings. Meanwhile, Polly pulls blueprints out of Iceberg's safe only to encounter two men in a bull and skull mask. Polly attacks them only to be beaten easily, but as it turns out, the blueprints are fake. Using Den Den Mushes, the other CP9 agents are alerted to gather in Iceberg's room. In Iceberg's room, the four CP9 agents reveal their identities. The foreman Luxi and Keiku, the secretary Khalifa, and the bar owner Blueno. At this time, however, Luffy manages to get free and breaks into the room only to be caught off guard by the powers of CP9, which include the ability to fire an air blade from their legs. Luffy and Polly are pinned to the ground, but after talking for a bit, Luffy manages to squeeze himself out and release Polly. Iceberg refuses to cooperate with the CP9 Soluchi, who, as it turns out, can speak normally, asks Kaku to check Iceberg's pulse to gauge his reaction to his theory. Lucy gives his theory as to what happened to the Pluton blueprints. It was assumed that Iceberg was the last apprentice of the shipwright Tom and inherited the blueprints as a result, since reports said that his other apprentice, Cuddy Flam, died when he was run over by the sea train. However, Cuddy Flam is not actually dead. He continues to live in the city to this very day under the name Frankie. When he hears this, Iceberg's pulse greatly quickens and Lucy concludes that he was right. Just as CP9 is about to leave to go after Frankie, Luffy, Polly, Zoro, Chopper, and Nami break into the room. When Polly finds out the situation, he attacks Luffy only to be beaten easily. The Kai reveals that all CP9 agents are capable of using Rokushiki, the six martial art techniques to put them beyond any other human. The Straw Hats try to talk to Robin, but she leaves stating that there's a wish she cannot accomplish when with them. As it turns out, CP9 had set a firebomb in the building to go off soon, but before that Luffy decides to show off his devil fruit power. The Neko Neko no Mai model let Luffy and Zoro attack him, only to be thrown across the island. And the building is engulfed in flames, with Iceberg and Polly tied up unconscious, Naomi thrown outside and Chopper buried under rubble inside. At this point, the four CP9 agents leave and come across several Frankie family members who are yelling around town that they have Usopp and the ship captive, and that Luffy has to go to the workplace under the bridge if he wants to see them again. Lucy beats them up to find an exact location, and the agents head for Frankie's hiding place. Meanwhile, at Frankie's hideout, Usopp continues to fix the ship while Frankie and his assistants, the Square Sisters, cry from his story. When Frankie asks what Usopp plans on doing once he fixes his ship, he replies that he's going back to Syrup Village in East Blue after adventuring for a bit longer. Frankie tells him that he cannot let him do that, since the ship will not even reach the next island. Nonetheless, go back to East Blue and suggests letting him dismantle it. After arguing, Frankie throws Usopp into the water under the ship so he can see for himself that the ship is too damaged to go anywhere. Even after resurfacing, Usopp continues fixing the ship and reveals that he already knew the ship was doomed. He tells them that in Skypea, the night after the ship was heavily damaged by Priest Shura, Usopp saw a strange figure in the fog fixing it, telling Usopp, don't worry, I'll carry everyone a little longer. The next day, though crudely done, the ship was fixed, and back in its original form without the upgrades made by the Sariyama Alliance. 
Not only was it odd that someone would be there to help them, but that they would know what the ship originally looked like, which led Usopp into thinking that the figure was the going Mary's soul. Frankie confirms this suspicion, telling Usopp about the Clab Outerman, a ship spirit that appears to warn and even save crew members when the ship is near destruction and only appears if the ship loves the crew it carries. Frankie points out that if Usopp traveled on the ship and ended up dying when it fell apart, the going Mary's soul would not be able to live with itself, but Usopp asks Frankie if he should just leave behind a friend when he is about to die. Before this discussion can go on much longer, the four CP9 members break in, knocking out the Square Sisters. Frankie recognizes them as being from the Galilei Company and attacks them, asking them what they think they are doing there. Lucy I reveals to him that they are from the government, and they know he is really Cuddy Flam, also claiming that they killed Iceberg. The cyborg is then knocked through a wall, revealing a dusty workshop, the place where Tom's workers operated, and the CP9 decide to look through it in search of the Pluton blueprints, tearing the room apart, but Frankie tells them to get out of there. Living with Prime's Cranky's past, 22 years ago, a young Frankie sails his newest ship only to be attacked by a Sea King, and his new weapons are ineffective against it. When he comes back onto shore, a young Iceberg scorns him for constantly making weapons as their mentor. A pufferfish fish man named Tom finishes up on a ship by tossing it into the air and throwing the masts in with great accuracy. As they, along with Yokozuna the frog, eat food made by Kokoro, she explains how the island is not getting any business, and when they do the shipbuilding companies fight each other over customers, and with the water level steadily rising, all anyone can do is wait for the city to sink. That night, however, Tom works on his plan to fix this problem. Later, after the execution of Goldie Roger, a judiciary ship arrives in the town to put Tom on trial. They are arresting anyone who helped the late pirate king, and Tom was the one who built his ship, the Oro Jackson. Tom is about to be sentenced to be executed at Eni's lobby, until he reveals his plans. He will build a sea train that can travel in any weather to connect the nearby islands together. After the judge requests a route to Inai's lobby, he gives Tom ten years to make the sea train before his trial is redone. Though Frankie is angry that Tom would be arrested for making such a great ship that reached the end of the Grand Line in the first place, Tom's workers immediately gets to work. After ten years, the puffing Tom makes its first successful launch. Government agents, led by the leader of Cypher Pole 5, Spandam, arrive at where Tom and Iceberg are, only to be shot by Frankie's cannons. Spandam ignored as Frankie exclaims that he finally made a ship strong enough to defeat a Sea King, but is once again yelled at by Iceberg, explaining that he cannot just leave such powerful weapons lying around. Spandam manages to get their attention again and talks with Tom personally. Spandam explains that he is after the blueprints for the Pluton, though Tom denies having them. The CP5 leader then threatens to reveal that Tom built Goldie, Roger's ship if he does not reveal where the plans are, only to be dumbfounded when Tom points out that everyone already knows that. After the agents leave, Tom takes the blueprints out of a safe and entrusts them to Iceberg and Frankie. Frankie suggests that they try to build it but is yelled at by Iceberg once again. Meanwhile, at a bar, Spandame laments that it is just not right for the builder of the Pirate King ship to go free. The next day, the judiciary ship comes back to give Tom a retrial, and everyone is sure that Tom will go free this time, until the ship is attacked. As Frankie watches in horror, the attacking ships turn out to be his own creations. And after the judiciary ship sinks, Spandame orders the agents controlling the ships to return and jump off the ship. Tom and Iceberg board the ships, once they stop attacking only to find that there is no one there, and are shot by some more ships. Frankie arrives to find them badly wounded, and the three are arrested by CP5. At the trial, Spandam claims that he was the one who saved everyone, and no one believes Frankie when he declares that Spandam was the one who attacked in the first place. It is pointed out by the CP5 leader that the ships were made by their company, but Frankie declares that no ship that hurts his friends like that is any ship of his, which Tom responds to by breaking out of his manacles and punching his apprentice for the first time. The fishman declares that no matter what a ship does, even if it ends up bringing about the end of the world, the creator must love it with all of his heart. He then runs up and attacks Spandam, too, only to be shot by tranquilizers. Since the creation of the sea train nullifies one crime, Tom requests that this one be erased, making it so that he will be executed for building the Oro Jackson, but Frankie and Iceberg are now safe. Frankie and Iceberg are released, and the first thing Frankie does is take a tranquilizer gun from a nearby soldier and smashes in Spandam's face with it. Frankie then runs away as the soldiers attack him. 
Tom is taken onto the sea train, which is leaving for Innie's lobby, and Frankie takes one of his boats farther down the track. As he stands on the track with Yokozuna watching, he fires cannons at the train, but it will not stop. He then tries to stop it with his bare hands only to get run over, supposedly getting killed. As Frankie and Usopp are restrained by CP9, Frankie is told that their commander would like to talk with him. As it turns out, the leader of CP9 is Spandam, who now has to wear a leather mask to cover his wounds, and he states that he will make Frankie pay for what he did to him before. CP9 decide to arrest Usopp too, as even though he left the crew, he still claims to be a pirate. Kaku then notices that they still have not gotten rid of the ship and releases it into the storm of Aqua Laguna. Meanwhile, at the Galilei headquarters, Iceberg, who was saved by Chopper at the last minute inside the Galilei headquarters, and Nami manage to regain consciousness and Iceberg requests to the other carpenters that they speak alone. Iceberg then reveals that Robin told him that CP9 could call for an island-destroying fleet of battleships, known as the Buster Call, thanks to permission from Ayokiji and that they would use it on the Straw Hat Pirates if Robin did not help assassinate Iceberg and come with them to be executed at Inni's lobby. In other words, the goal she cannot reach when with the Straw Hats is for the six crew members, excluding herself, to leave the island safely. With the knowledge that Robin did not betray them, Nami rushes to wake up Chopper. Polly wakes up and tells the other shipwrights that the pirates were not the assassins, but lies that he did not see who the attackers really were and that Lucie, Kaku, and Khalifa were at home. Naomi rushes to stop the sea train, led by Polly and several other Galila workers, while Chopper and other workers search for Luffy and Zoro. At the Blue Station, the four CP9 agents, along with Korji and their prisoners, board the sea train as Sanji observes the situation. Due to the severe weather conditions, the sea train is forced to depart from the station early. As the train starts to leave, Sanji sneaks on board but Naomi and the others get there just in time to see it leave. Thankfully, the carpenters find a note from Sanji that states that he's on the train along with a baby Den Den Mushi, so they can contact each other once he finds a Den Den Mushi on the train. Thus, Nami switches her priorities to finding a ship to chase after them, but Polly says it would be crazy to use a ship during Aqua Laguna. During this, Kokoro watches the ocean, noting that the distance the water drawback shows how strong the following waves will be during Aqua Laguna. This year, the water draws back an abnormally large distance, giving the appearance of the ocean drying up. At this point, Chimney notices something in the back alleys, and as Nami approaches them, she points out that Luffy is stuck between two of the buildings. Meanwhile, Chopper looks at the back alley too and sees Zoro stuck in a chimney. Both Nami and Chopper hop across the buildings to where each respective crewmate is, while Chopper tries to pull Zoro out of the chimney, handing Zoro his sword upon request. Naomi yells to Luffy that Robin gave up her life so that they could escape the government's wrath. Luffy then pushes the buildings he was stuck between apart and Zoro slices in half. The building whose chimney he was stuck in just as the first wave of Aqua Laguna crashes towards them. They just barely manage to reach higher ground only to underestimate the strength of the waves and are engulfed. Thankfully, Polly was close by and manages to pull them up. But it is still not over as they have to quickly reach even higher ground before they are caught again. They succeed and the two crewmates are told about the situation. Meanwhile, on Puffing Tom, Sanji tries to decide the best course of action when he is found by an agent. He kicks the agent through the cart, drawing the attention of everyone there. One of them suggests alerting CP9. But the CP6 agent Jerry, a very tall man that needs to bend over to fit in the cart, says that there's no need to do that. He tries to fight Sanji only to be beaten without any effort. In the car where CP9 is staying, Cordy explains that in the fifth car is the Marine Captain T-Bone, in the fourth ones of CP7. And finally in the third, the newest member of CP9, Nero making it so that there is no chance of any attackers reaching them. Back at Water 7, Luffy decides that they are going to take a ship to chase after Robin, but Polly points out it is useless since no ship can get past a normal Aqua Laguna and this year's is far beyond average. At this point, Kokoro says that if any ship could get past this, it would be the sea train and tells the Straw Hats to follow her. She takes them to an old cellar where the prototype sea train, Rocketman, was kept, and they find Iceberg finishing up on maintenance. He had the same idea as Kokoro and came to the warehouse earlier to get it ready, and the train is ready for departure. Luffy and Zoro manage to fully recover by eating a bunch of meat and sake brought by Nami and a pair of conductors. Before they can leave, the Frankie family appears before them. They tearfully request to Luffy that they come with them to Eni's lobby so they can rescue Frankie 
and Luffy lets the group join them as Luffy, Zoro, Nami, and Chopper get on board with Kokoro conducting. The train launches out of one of the gates in the city straight into Aqua Laguna. As the train launches out of the city, the Frankie family attaches their cart to the train, bringing along their King Bull Sodom and Kamara, and Kokoro steers the ship onto the tracks, greatly boosting its speed. Being a prototype, Rocketman's speed cannot be controlled, and once it gets on the tracks, it is almost impossible to steer. As it turns out, Chimney, Gonby, Polly, Tilestone, and Lulu stowed on board. After Polly tells the other two foremen the identities of the assassins, he reveals that he came along to avenge Iceberg. Since they share a common enemy, the Straw Hat Pirates, Galilei Company, and Frankie family officially form an alliance. Meanwhile, on the Puffing Tom, Sanji breaches the next car, which is where Usopp and Frankie are being kept. After being convinced that Frankie is good by Usopp P, Sanji reluctantly frees both of them, and they climb on top of the next car, where Captain T-Bone is stationed. Using a Den Den Mushi from the previous car, he calls Naomi and is told about Robin's situation. Back at the Rocketman, a huge wave is coming towards them, and despite the best efforts of the Frankie family and the Galley Lay foreman, they cannot break it apart. At this point, Luffy and Zoro make their move by performing their ultimate combo attack, Gomu Gomu no Sanbiaku Pound Cannon, and blast a huge tunnel through the wave, saving the train. Though Frankie decides to help rescue Robin, Usopp refuses to, citing that he is no longer a member of the crew and walks away. Minutes later, however, a masked man in a cape who looks exactly like Usopp, calling himself Sogeking, appears before them and says that Usopp told him about the entire situation and that he is willing to help. Sanji and Frankie see right through his disguise, but decide not to say anything. As Captain T-Bone, a zombie-like but honorable night swordsman, and his soldiers look through the last two cars, the three intruders detach them from the rest of the train, leaving very few people left. They enter the next car, which holds the kitchen, and encounter the CP7 Chef Wands, a very odd-looking and energetic man that makes Raymond with his nose hairs and fights using ramen kenpo. Sanji holds him off as Frankie and Sogi can continue to the next car. Sanji battles Wands and Frankie faces off with Nero as Sogekin continues on to Robin's car by using Suction Octopi to walk along the side of the train. He tells Robin about the situation, but she still refuses to be saved. When Corgi comes in to see the source of the noise, Sogeking hides under Robin's cloak. In the kitchen, Wands proves to be very weak, but Sanji cannot hurt him with his kicks, since his feet will get stuck in his Roman armor. The straw hat cook manages to bypass this, however, by using knives to cut the armor apart, stating that he's in a kitchen and he's cutting up food, so he can ignore his legs only rule in this case. After a while, Rocketman approaches the detached cars and, after Luffy makes sure Sanji and the others aren't not on it, Zoro cuts it in half to get it off the tracks. Soon afterwards, they come across Captain T-Bone, who ran on ahead on the sea train tracks in a desperate attempt to stop the intruders. T-Bone fires projectile slashes towards Zoro, but he manages to dodge them and knocks T-Bone off the tracks. On the top of car three, Frankie is overwhelmed by Nero's speed especially once he discovers that his back is his weak point, but through trickery Frankie manages to pin him down. As the cyborg punches Nero through the roof, Sanji kicks wands through several cars until he lands right next to the CPN agents. In Robin's car, Korgai finds Sogeking, but he is shot by one of his gunpowder stars. Despite Sogeking trying to stop her, Robin goes into the car where CP9, Sanji, and Frankie are. She once again denies their help, even going as far as attacking the Sniper King, but he throws a smoke bomb, and the four criminals escape to the last car, detaching it from CP9's car. However, Khalifa manages to grab onto the car with her whip, and it is pulled in by Blueno. Frankie sacrifices himself by breaking down the wall being held by Blueno and falling back into their car, but this is futile as Blueno teleports to the separated car with an air door using his devil fruit power. He attacks Sanji and Usopap, but Robin has him stop on the condition that she willingly goes with him. Before Sanji can counterattack, Blue No and Robin go into the air door back to the sea train. Talking to Robin, Frankie learns that Iceberg is still alive and then informs her that no matter what anyone says, simply being alive is not a sin. Puffing Tom then arrives at the No Night Government Island of Eni's lobby. Yokozuna the Frog appears on the tracks to test his strength against Rocketman, and the impact separates the Frankie family's car from the train and knocks the train off the tracks. After landing on the train, Kokoro calls the frog over and he is extremely happy to see her. 
since he thought she was kidnapped by the government. Somehow managing to talk to the frog, Kokoro finds out that he was attacking the sea train so he could become stronger and so he will be able to stop his friends from being taken away again. She informs him that Frankie was taken just like Tom was, and Yokozuna decides to accompany them to Ini's lobby. Meanwhile, the Frankie family come across the cars Sanji and Sogi King were in and the two board theirs. As the sky starts to turn blue again, Ini's lobby comes in sight. He united with Sanji, and Soga King sop shortly thereafter on the Rocketman. The Straw Hats, along with the Frankie family and Galley Lee, began an all-out assault on the government island of Ini's lobby against thousands of marine soldiers and the Cypher Pole agents in a last-ditch effort to rescue their friends Nico Robin and Frankie before they are dragged through the gates of justice. The massive doors are the only thing standing between Robin and Frankie and their respective destinations. Marine headquarters and the terrifying prison of Impeldown. While the others battled with the giants Oemo and Kashi dog-riding guards, monstrous jurors and a three-headed judge, Luffy rushes ahead and engages the numerous marines and agents on the island. In spite of their numbers and numerous wrong turns, he overpowers them and eventually reaches the roof of the courthouse. Meanwhile, Spandem gloats with overconfidence until a marine finally reports in that casualties are mounting at a horrendous reese over 2,000 so far, with Luffy himself responsible. Furthermore, thanks to his previous contact with Dory and Brogi, Soga King was able to convince Oimo and Kashi to defect. For the first time, Spandam starts to panic. On the courthouse roof, Luffy encounters CP9 agent Blue No. Unlike last time, Luffy is able to keep track and match his skill. Then Luffy reveals his new Gear 2 ability, which allows him to imitate the technique sword to great effect, enhances his body to withstand the strain while using it, and allows him to overpower Blueno's strongest Tekkai technique, ultimately knocking him. Frankie used his Coupe de Boo to free himself from his chains, taking Robin with him. Luffy called out to Robin and told her that he was coming for her. She replied that she didn't want to be saved and that she just wanted to die. Robin's past is finally revealed, as well as her last reason for being unwilling to return to the crew. Having been betrayed so many times in the past, she's terrified that one day the Straw Hats will see her as a burden and also betray her. The other Straw Hats quietly acknowledged the reason Robin had, then Spandam burst out laughing, saying she's absolutely accurate, and nobody would be stupid enough to think she wasn't a burden after traveling with her. Spandam pointed at the flag on top of the Tower of Justice and told Lufe that the organization after Robin is over 170 affiliated nations. Luffy acknowledged this, then told Saga King to shoot down the flag. Soga King Kahat pirates had just declared war on the world government. Ten unable to doubt her friends any longer after seeing them declare them is terrified. However, Judge Baskerville ordered the personnel to fire the mortar cannon to forcibly stop the drawbridge. The mortar cannon fired, stopping the drawbridge, and Spandam started to drag Rob. Thought there should not exist a weapon like this without having a weapon against it in the case of it falling into the hands of someone like Spandam. Because he figured this was the only way to satisfy the wish of the architect. Fruit abilities for the first time. Meanwhile, Soga King tried to steal the key from the sleeping Jabra without a fight. Before he came to making noise that woke Jabra up, he recognized Soga as a pirate and attacks him, form rather than the hybrid. Jabra finds Kaku's new appearance very funny indeed, and they get into an argument until Zoro only changed into his hybrid form, but his appearance makes Zoro lose his focus, annoyed that everybody is laughing at him, lost his temper and cut the tower in half with his rank yak, a main deshi. Zoro and Soggy King avoid the attack but find themselves accidentally locked together by the ceased in handcuffs. Since Keiku and Jabra cannot decide who gets to kill their opponents while they are handcuffed together, they offer to unlock the two to avoid getting into another argument. Sadly, neither of them had the correctly numbered key, with Kaku having number five and Jabra having number one, so they resign themselves to fighting both of them. Meanwhile, Chopper managed to find the room where Zoro and Soge King are fighting. They tell Chopper that he must find one of the other CP9 members and get the number two key. Chopper ran off, hoping that Sanji will have the right key. In the dungeon, Kumidori has Nami trapped with his hair attacks, giving her no opportunity to use her climb attack. Frankie, low on cola and thus unable to use any special attacks, is forced to box with Fukuru. They compared the strength of their punches and find themselves evenly matched in strength and toughness. After three cups of tea... Sanji came to his senses and demanded Khalifa's key. She took advantage of his reluctance to hurt women 
and kicked him across the room. Finally, Luffy reached the bottom of the judicial tower, where he can see Gates is a giant whirlpool. Naomi is nearly killed by Kumidori before Chopper attacked him to rescue her, and she escaped having stolen Kumidori's key. Sanji suddenly fell from an upper story, his body terribly wounded and deformed by some unknown power into a doll-like figure. He explained his plight to Nami, who gently chastised him for his foolishness before advancing to face Khalifa herself. At the gates of justice, Luffy nearly drowned trying to cross the ocean by himself, but is rescued by Gonbei and Chimney, who led him to a secret passage that Spandam had used earlier. It led to the lower areas of the tower and eventually to an immovable steel door. He broke through it with his new gear three. The attack was not shown, but afterwards his body is briefly shrunk to child size. Luffy returned to normal as he pursued Luchi and Spandam. Luchi informed his commander that they are being followed, and Spandam ordered him to wait behind to hold off any pursuit while he takes Robin to the gates of justice. Meanwhile, Frankie and Fukuru's battle continued into the kitchen, each one trying to punch harder than the other. As the two swapped blows and taunts, Frankie began to flag due to lack of cola, but their fight was interrupted by Kumadori and Chopper, who burst in through one wall. Chopper's first rumble ball has worn off, so he stalled Kumadori by locking him in an enormous fridge. He joined forces with Frankie, and after accidentally giving the cyborg the wrong drink several times, Chopper gave Frankie a full cola refill. Frankie, a supercharged, punched Fukuru out of the building, and their fight continued outside, taking them down into the ocean and then high above the tower, where Frankie ended the fight with his cooped event cannon. Frankie then grabs the number four key off of Fukuru's coat pocket. Zoro and Usopp are still handcuffed together and running from Kaku and Jabra as best they can. The two agents manage to get into another argument in the process, giving Zoro and Usopp a chance to form a plan. If Zoro cannot hold a sword with Usopp on his arm, Usopp must become his sword and be used as a weapon instead. Usopp reluctantly agreed. Back in the kitchen, Kumadori escaped from the fridge by eating his way out and confronted Chopper, who is forced to eat another rumble ball in the hope of beating this powerful enemy. However, eating two rumble balls in such a short time made his transformations random and erratic, leaving him open to attacks. In the end, even his strongest attack could not defeat Kumadori, and he fell badly wounded. In the moment before Kumadori finished him, he remembered the last time he took three rumble balls in a row, and how he woke up to hear that a monster had destroyed much of his village. His mentor, Dr. Kurei, had told him that the monster had been him and made him promise to never do it again. With an apology to Kurei, and hoping that his friends aren't nearby, he took a third rumble ball and grew into a gigantic, terrifying monster that dwarfs Kumadori. He crushed the CP9 agent and threw him from the Tower of Justice to the main island. In Khalifa's room, Naomi's battle seemed to have ended prematurely. She lay paralyzed on the floor as Khalifa calmly took a bath. Naomi, recovering her strength, tried to attack the CP9 agent, who defended herself with her newfound devil fruit powers. She is revealed to have eaten the Awa Awa no Mi, which allows her to create bubbles which can weaken enemies, hardened in soap for defense, inking or transmute an enemy's body entirely as in the case of Sanji. Having worked this out, Naomi continued to fight, but is soon weakened by Khalifa's bubbles. Down in the basement, Luffy finally caught up to Luchi, who held him at bay while Spandem escaped towards the gates of justice with Robin. When Robin tried to escape, Spandem attempted to summon CP9 with his ordinary Den Den Mushi, but used the golden Den Den Mushi by mistake, which summons the Buster Call, a powerful marine fleet with orders to destroy the entire island. Realizing his mistake, Spandem contacted all the marines stationed on the island, ordering them to report in. Meanwhile, Marine Headquarters receives the Buster Call signal on the Silver Den Den Mushi. Noting the target to be Eni's lobby, they decide to launch the fleet straight from Headquarters, so as to reach there within 30 minutes. Spandam, at first panicking and not realizing that he is still on air, started to gloat that the lives of the Marines do not matter as long as he can bring Robin alive to the Gates of Justice. Robin cut in on his broadcast with a warning to the Marines, understandably alarmed, the listening marines evacuated the island, leaving the Frankie family and Galila workers behind as prisoners. Hearing Robin's warning, Luffy tried to force his way past Luchi to reach her, but Luxi fought back fiercely and stopped him in his tracks, forcing him to continue the fight. 
Jabber and Kaku decided to end their fight with Zoro and Usopp quickly in order to escape the approaching bombardment. In Khalifa's room, Nami struggled against the superior skill and powers of her opponent, who began to transmute Nami's body just like she did with Sanji. Before she can finish Nami off, however, Chopper broke into the room, still in monstrous form and totally out of control. The giant Chopper attacked Nami wildly, uprooting Khalifa's bath in the process. He threw it down the stairs to where Sanji lay unconscious below, drenching the whole area with water before storming off. The water from the bath washed away Khalifa's weakening bubbles. A splash on Nami's leg let her realize how to restore herself using rain tempo. She then used Mirage Tempo to confuse Khalifa before eventually defeating her with a Thunder Lance Tempo and taking her key. Meanwhile, Chopper wandered into Zoro and Soga King's fight, and Zoro fought to protect him from Jabra and Kaku. Frankie arrived and decided that the only way to stop Chopper is to knock him into the ocean to cancel his Devil Fruit powers. He blew Chopper out of the tower with his coop de vent, then jumped in after to save him. Naimi unlocked Zoro and Sogi King's handcuffs, allowing the real fight against Jabra and Kaku to begin. Robin tried to escape from Spandom, but he stopped her by attacking with Funk Freed. With Chopper back to normal, safe, and out of the water, Frankie remembered that Naimi told him to head towards the Gates of Justice to try Fukuru and Kumadori's keys on Robin's handcuffs, so Chimney and Gombe showed him the way. Zoro began to once again battle Kaku. Kaku revealed more impressive abilities through the use of his devil fruit, using his nose as a larger version of Shigen. The deflected blow easily cut into a boulder nearby. Jabra caught Usopp off guard by offering him the key without a fight, but attacked Usopp at the last moment, knocking him down. With his opponent helpless, Jabra began to gloat at Usopp's weakness, but is cut short by the sudden arrival of Sanji, returned to his normal self by the falling water from Khalifa's bath. He distracted Jabra and told the wounded Usopp to help any way he can. Outside, the sea train departed, filled to capacity with escaping marines. Meanwhile, Polly, he used his rope skills to pretend he was bound, managed to untie the other captives, and they tried to find an alternative way off the island. Fighting Sanji on the tower's high landing, Jabra revealed his Tekai Kimpo, a fighting style which allows him to move and fight while using Tekai, making him all but immune to Sanji's kicks. Suddenly, Jabra stopped the fight, tearfully offering Sanji his key and telling him that Robin is really his long-lost sister. Sanji ignored the deception and continued the fight. Meanwhile, Usopp, high above on the tower, came up with a plan to combat Jabra's impenetrable Tekai. Sanji creates a new technique, Diable Jam, where he heats up one foot with friction, resulting in powerful kicks that burn through his enemy's defense. He kicked Jabra all the way down to the ground floor, defeating him. Meanwhile, Spandam dragged Nico Robin across the Bridge of Hesitation, a long bridge that leads to the Gates of Justice. Frankie caught up to Luffy and Luki and asks Luffy if he needed help. Luffy snapped at him, telling not to interfere. He told Frankie to take the keys and head to where Robin is, behind the door Luki is guarding. Zoro and Kaku continued their duel, with Kaku using his devil fruit power to gain the upper hand, wounding Zoro with a rain of rank Yaku attacks. Zoro stalled Kaku by mocking his voice, angry now, and experimenting wildly with his transformations. Kaku changed to a more powerful form, which removes his long neck while lengthening his arms and legs. Combined with larger swords he retrieved, Kaku gained the upper hand and mocked Zoro's attempt to rescue Robin. This angered Zoro, prompting him to unleash a new mysterious technique, Nine Sword Style, which made him appear like an Asura deity. Three faces, plus six arms, meant nine swords total. Realizing the danger, Kaku prepared his finishing blow, the powerful Rankiyaku attack that sliced the tower in half, Ichibugin, which was so powerful it negated Kaku's Rankiyaku and finally incapacitated the CP9 agent. In the end, Zoro delivers Polly's message of termination, and the downed Kaku freely gave Zoro his key and even shared a joke with the man who defeated him. At this moment, Sanji catches up to Zoro and learns the last key is now theirs. Robin admitted she is afraid of death and tried to escape, even biting down on the bridge to stall for time. At the same time, she insisted in her mind that the crew will be coming to save her. Luffy is unable to hurt Luke Shi, who hit him with a rapid-fire shigan. 
Frankie comes to Luffy's aid by trying to hit Luchi with the same move he used against Fukuru. Frankie's move is unsuccessful against Luchi's much stronger Tekkai and Luchi prepared to strike Frankie. Luffy used his Gear 2 ability and knocked Luchi away. Frankie was astonished by Luffy's strength and power and encouraged him to defeat Luchi. Luffy manages to keep the now-transformed Luchi at bay and allowed Frankie to leave the room to chase after Spandam and Robin. On the bridge, Spandam dragged Robin by a rope, gloating that no one will ever reach her because he set up landmines behind them. He then explained that his father, Spandine, was the one who led the destruction of Ohara, which infuriated Robin. There is an explosion as Frankie triggered the landmines and is blown into the water, and Spandam laughed that no one will save Robin. Spandam is suddenly hit in the head by a missile, and the marines waiting to transport the prisoner are also attacked. Sodi King had fired the shots from the top of the Tower of Justice, a distance that none of the marines could hit with any weapon and none could see without binoculars. Robin escaped and the marines fired at her, but Frankie jumped in the way to block the bullets the landmines had only delayed him. So Ging shot Zoro and Sanji's keys to Frankie, leaving him with all of the keys to use on Robin's cuffs. The number five key was the right. Spandam is shocked that CP9 was defeated. With all the keys in hand, Frankie eventually unlocks Robin's sea stone cuffs. Robin thanks Saojikin, but he replied that she should save the thanks until later. So Gekin also tells Robin that she is now free to do whatever she wants, and Robin made her decision. Using her devil fruit abilities, she attacked Spandam. The celebration is cut short when the buster call arrived, and the top of the judicial tower is blown up. The defensive fence surrounding Ini's lobby is also destroyed. Frankie shouted out that this is their last chance to escape, as there is an escort ship at the end of the bridge. In the tunnels beneath the towers, Nami, Kokoro carrying Chopper on her head, Chimney and Gombi continued their escape. The battle with Luffy and Luchi raged on. Luffy is able to land an attack on Luchi, who is forced back with pain. Lukai then explained to Luffy that his Gear 2 ability is wearing his body away and shortening his lifespan by pumping blood into his legs, causing his blood flow to speed up. Luffy yelled back that he does not care and wishes to save his comrades first. So Luchi raised the stakes and used a Rankiyaku to smash a wall, causing water to flow into the tower in the tunnel system below. Anyone in it? Any enemy of Luffy's comrades trying to catch up to him? Will drown. Spandam ordered the Marines to take back Robin but the marines stopped as they see the buster call approaching. The buster call is now upon Ini's lobby and is about to destroy everything. The fleet appears along with the five vice admirals. The buster call marines explain that they can destroy everything but the bridge on Ini's lobby because Robin is standing there, although Spandam thinks it is because of his presence. It is revealed that during the last buster call, everything on Ohara was destroyed except for the ground where Spandeen was standing. The Frankie family continued to rush to the gates of justice. Meanwhile, Sogik, blown off from the attack on the tower, falls to where Sanji and Zoro are located. They tried to get Sogeking to leave, but he is slowed by injuries. He tried to explain the properties of Kabuto, but is cut off by Sanji. Nami, Chopper, Kokoro, Chimney, and Ganbe are under the room where Luchi and Luffy are fighting, which is also filling up with water. Having exhausted himself, Luffy is attacked fiercely by Luchi, who taunted that he thought Luffy was stronger. So Luffy unleashes Gear 3, briefly explaining how it works. His arm then swelled to massive proportions, and he attacked Luchi with a Gomu Gomu no Giant Pistol, sending him flying through the wall and toward the sea. A Marine asked Vice Admiral Doberman how to handle the capture of Nico Robin. The Vice Admiral ordered him to ignore her and began to explain about Luchi's past. Fifteen years ago, an incident happened where 500 soldiers were captured on an island by pirates. The pirates' captain wanted to become the king of the island in return for sparing the soldiers' lives. Just as the island was about to fall, the world government sent a boy to the island. The boy infiltrated the pirates' hideout and killed the 500 soldiers on the spot. The pirates, infuriated, began to shoot at the boy. The boy emerged from the explosions, killed the pirates' captain, and ended the incident. That boy, at the age of 13, became a member of CP9 and has become the strongest killing machine since CP9's inception. The Marines, upon hearing the story, became frightened. The Vice Admiral tells the Marines that as long as that man is here assisting in the recapture of Nico Robin, they do not need to act and will do nothing until all but the bridge of hesitation is destroyed.
In the tunnels, Zoro, Sanji, and Sogeking heard the sound of water and Sinami Kokoro with chopper on her hat, chimney, and Gombi running away from the rushing water. The water began to fill up the passage, engulfing them all. Luxi, after receiving a Gear 3 attack, is knocked out and landed on one of the marine ships. After recovering, Luki returns to human form and takes off his shirt, showing scars on his back similar to the world government's symbol. Luffy inhaled deeply and then attacked the ship. The marines fired at him, but Luffy was unaffected. Luffy resumed his fight with Luchi, attacking with a Gomu Gomu no Jigen axe, but Luchi managed to dodge it. He turned into his complete animal form and bit Luffy. Luffy escaped by expanding his body, while Luki returned to his human form. Luffy tried to hit Luxi with a Gomu Gomu no Gigant whip, but Luxi dodged it as the attack destroyed the mast of the ship. Luchi fired a Tobu Shigen Beishi and hit Luffy and deduced that Luffy's speed decreases as his strength increases. The ship starts to split, while Luxi laughed boldly. Vice Admiral Onigumo noted Luchi and Luffy fighting and ordered the fleet to target the ship they are on. He explained that if it's Luchi, then he will survive. A marine objected to the idea, saying that 1,000 marines are aboard the ship. The vice admiral killed the marine on the spot, asking if he can protect the future from a criminal with his weakness. The ships begin firing, and the ship that Luffy and Luchi is on is hit. Luffy escaped the bombardment, returning to the tower. However, when he lands, he is shrunk from the side effects of Gear 3. He then hid from Luki until he could return to normal size. Spandam mocked the pirate, thinking Luffy died in the attack, and continued to brag about the buster call until Frankie punched him in the face. Angry, Spandam tried to attack Robin with Funk Freed in elephant form, but is stopped by Frankie, who threw the animal back right on top of Spandam. Luchi found Luffy and began to attack him. However, right before Luxi could strike the finishing blow, the damage from the gear through attack starts to hurt. As he struggled with the pain, Luffy returned to normal. In the tunnels, Zoro and the others slowly drown. As they neared death, Kokoro saved them all by revealing her true identity as a mermaid. Robin and Frankie hijacked Spandam's escape ship, and Kokoro soon arrived, jumping into the ship with the unconscious Straw Hat crew. Robin and Frankie thank her as she changed back into a human and their friends woke up, but they realized they still need to wait for Luffy. Meanwhile, Oimo and Kashi, who had been carrying Zombai, Mazu and Kiwi, the rest of the Frankie family, Polly, Lulu, Tylestone, Sodom, Gomora, and Yokozuna out of the path of the Buster Call, finally reached the exit of Ini's lobby. However, they are attacked by three Buster Call ships. Hit by cried out for Luffy, Usopp encouraged Luffy to get up and to stop looking so defeated. Usopp tells Luffy that he came to save Robin, not to see Luffy being beaten up and then challenged Luchi to a fight. Luffy stopped him, knowing that Usopp will be killed almost instantly. Now more determined than ever, Luffy got up again to fight. Despite being attacked again and again by Luchi, Luffy still fought back. Luki hit Luffy with another Rokugan. But this time, Luffy does not fall, using everything he has left. Luffy threw Chopper Robin and Luffy onto the Going Merry before boarding herself. Spandam returned, broken and bruised from being hit with Funk Freed, and orders the marines to open fire on Mary, falsely claiming to have permission from Admiral Aokiji. Two Buster Call ships fired, only to get caught up in a strong current and hit each other. Sanji, during his absence, had started to close the gates of justice, causing the whirlpool currents to return. As Nami used the current to elude the battleships, more shots are fired, which Zoro and Sanji deflected by using Luffy as a sling. Spandem yelled more orders, but Robin used her powers to break his spine. Finally, Frankie used the cooped event to catapult ship and all out of danger. At the front of the island, the Frankie family galley lay giants, king bulls, and Yokozuna commandeered the puffing Tom and returned to Water 7. Aokiji arrived on the scene and declared that with the island in ruins, there is no way they can depict Ini's lobby as anything but a complete defeat for the world government. The reunited Straw Hat pirates leave the chaos of the Buster Call behind and sailed out of Eni's lobby. Sometime later, they see a galley lay ship with Iceberg and his shipwrights in it. However, their joy is short-lived as Mary's hull finally gave out and splits in two. Luffy pleaded with Iceberg to fix the ship up one last time, but Iceberg cannot. He'd already done what he could. As he saw the ship laying on Scrap Island after having been dumped from Frankie's lair by CP9, 
He too heard the voice of the ship and decided to grant its request to sail once again. The ship was then carried off by the waves of Aqua Laguna and sailed off on its own. He declared what he saw before him as a miracle, a ship so loved by its crew that it went beyond its limits to save them one last time. He praised ship and crew for such extraordinary loyalty. Luffy comes to realize what Iceberg is saying and understands what has to be done. After moving to Iceberg's ship, Luffy and the rest of his crew give Mary a Viking funeral, setting her ablaze for her final voyage. As the crew lament the funeral of their ship, they each hear the soul of Mary, thanking them for taking good care of her. Though Luffy argued that her damage was their fault, Mary says that she was happy with her only regret that she could not continue their voyage with them. As the ship starts to burn away, the crew mourn their friend as Mary once more thanks them for a wonderful life. I...